Good morning and welcome to another episode of Sync Riffs. So happy to uh, be in the studio here with a very special guest this morning uh, from Nashville, indie singer-songwriter, Americana artist, Katie Cole. Good morning, Katie. How's it going? Going great. Thank you for having me and all using all the hyphens. <laughs> <laughs> No, we've worked together for a minute, and it's it's uh, really great to uh, have you in the studio today to talk about. You have a new release that just came out, uh, Rivers and Roads, a five-track EP. And But before we set that up, um, you know, I know you're in Nashville by way of, so from Melbourne, Australia, to Los Angeles, then to Nashville. Yes. And your path and your journey and your sound ar along the way has has um, morphed, if you will, into the current state of, of Americana. And would love yes. to for our guests to uh, have a little backstory on that journey. Yes, it's definitely rivers and roads and plains and jet lag. <laughs> <laughs> in that order. In, in, probably in that order and pretty much with my day-to-day touring life as a side musician in the Smashing Pumpkins, it's pretty much a, it's a yearly occurrence where I'm like, I don't know when it, wh when is it? <laughs> what time is it? Um, but I, it, I think um, the, the genre of songwriting sort of changes as you evolve artistically. Like I've got such a, a love for music in so many different genres. And I, I think, you know, you tend to record what you, are experiencing and whatever you're sort of into at that moment, um, even though moments for recording usually last for a couple of years because it takes time to get things together, do pre-production, go into the studio, then actually release things. So those you know, extended moments, I've gone from, I suppose, you know, pop rock to um, sort of folk rock to uh, country to mm. Americana. Um, and I'm sort of full circle at that moment where I can utilize the word Americana because it's kind of an umbrella um, genre in a lot of ways. Like I, I think of it as like the everything that's like the all the other genres, like all the misfits and outcast genres all kind of hop under the umbrella and be like, this I'm Americana now. Um, so that sort of fits for me because I tend to sort of, I like things that are sometimes a little soul infused, sometimes a little country infused. But overall, it's always like this the storytelling. So I think like I'll probably stay under the umbrella of um, Americana for a while just because it, it encompasses so many things that have always been of interest to me and I don't have mm -hmm. to think about is this too rock or is this too folk? It's like it all kind of works. Yes, yes. No, and it, it, uh, it definitely, and I think the story arc, correct, on it might have been when you were in Los Angeles, your first release that was – you linked up with Howard Willing. He produced Lost Inside a Moment. Yes. And then through the years, he's also produced, correct, some of your tracks when you are in Nashville. Yes, correct. It's It's been a really long process of, I suppose, like because your songwriting sort of evolves, having having a collaborator around you that sort of understands what you're trying to achieve, like the bigger picture rather than going – this is what you were saying you want to do. It's having someone that can also interpret that's had years of experience to be able to go, I think what you really want to do might be more in this vein and to encompass these elements and utilize mm -hmm. these musicians rather than, because like I end up, you know, when I say the word pre-production, pre I mean, I'm really pre-recording everything that I write and demoing things up to a point of, you know, it's sometimes it's 70, 80% of where the song really ends up being when it's recorded in a studio. Mm -hmm. So I already know for the most part where I want a song to be, but sometimes it's that element of, you know, when I take, when I take things to Howard before we actually record and it's like he, he knows, he's like, well, we need this drama because this drama is going to mm -hmm. do that job better than this one and mm -hmm. this steel player will do this or this keyboard player will do that and, Having someone that knows how to, again, interpret the, this is the what I've got, but this is where we actually want to go. So, yeah. I mean, I can't, I don't have, I'm too focused and I'm too in my my one lane of like, this is what I did and it was really hard. And you know, to, to be able to see 
the bigger picture. And even if I can see the bigger picture, I don't always know how to get there. Mm -hmm. So having somebody that I trust that I know won't lead, lead my bigger picture and my artistic vision astray, Mm -hmm. I'll always listen to him. And sometimes it's, I'll be like, Oh, I don't like that. Or I don't like this, or I don't like that. But he's the same with me. Like he'll listen to songs and be like, I don't like that bridge or I don't Mm. like this, this line. And you need to go back and rewrite that. And having this sort of push and pull in a creative relationship is super healthy. And Mm -hmm. I think that's, you know, most bands have that internally within the structure. They'll push and pull each other to, if you have to fight for an idea, then you you have to kind of have a reason for why you're fighting for it rather than just like, it's the idea that I had. That's not a good enough reason. Like Mm -hmm. the first thing that you write isn't always the best thing. Like they always say what, you know, good songs are written and great songs are rewritten for that reason because you you then have perspective on, okay, this is what I was trying to say, but I didn't quite get there. So I need to go, I need to rewrite this section here and, you know, mm-hmm. make make this story a bit stronger or make this bridge a bit stronger or elaborate this because it doesn't, it doesn't get the release that we want musically or whatever mm-hmm. it is. Mm-hmm. I love having someone that has been able to help me grow artistically. Yes, yes. No, amazing because – you know, this new EP, if we want to talk about correct, you released one song in a, in, in a chronology, and now the uh, finished work, Rivers and Roads, it's five songs. So songs like Young and Stupid, I'm Going Backwards, Maybe Memphis, Call You Up, Dreams of Mine, and then River Flow. Yes. Uh, songs about falling in and out of love. Um, did Howard, he's on some of those tracks? Well, he's, I mean, he produced, engineered and mixed the project. Um, So he's been my, again, my, my bigger um, overlord in the situation. (laughs) And I did release, I basically released four out of five of the songs before releasing the EP in its entirety. And I had a few, few, I think I had one or two songs in between them as well that were ones that I hadn't released yet from um, previous projects. I'm not, um, I'm never married to the idea of releasing things just because they're what you've got. Like I, th- I think it's like the right song at the right time. Yes. I'm a big sort of advocate for that because it's, it's like you can release, you know, four songs at once and if people are only paying attention to one of them, then w- just release that one song. Yeah. You know? So I just kind of, I, I sort of pick my battles and I'm a bit, um, more particular about why and when I'm releasing things mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. because I've done things in the past where I've just put out EPs with just like one sort of focus track and many songs have been overlooked as a result and then you you can't really do that magic of like, well, I'll just really keep releasing singles off this thing that's already out there because right. in the minds of a listener, it's like, well, it's old, <laughs> you know, whereas it's yeah. not. Yeah. You haven't heard it yet. It's new to you. But right. if you see like if – if I put out something last year and I'm releasing a single off it today, then you, then you look back and you're like, but it's like, it was, that was from 2022. That was like, mm-hmm. that was like in pandemic years, that was like 70 years ago. <laughs> right. So I don't know. I think, I mean, I try not to let public perceptions that have into my brain too mm-hmm. much, but I do mm-hmm. think the right song at the right time. And this was one that I just kept, I kept releasing singles off it and some videos to accompany and visualizers to accompany these songs too is, is very important because mm-hmm. um, I do think people kind of listen with their eyes still. Mm-hmm. Um, and the final song, Young and Stupid, came, you know, came out with this, with, with this release and I'm super proud of that song and I do have a video to come um, with that too and I think it's in another week or two. Um, that will be out too, but it's it's mm-hmm. it's a difficult process to put together a group of songs that I don't know that you think will all kind of belong together, but stand out enough on their own to not all sound like the same song. So yeah. I mean, that was that's a challenge. That's a challenge with putting anything on an EP or an album. It's like, does this all say one thing? Does this say a bigger story? Right. But individually, these songs can still stand on their own. So yeah. I, I struggle with that a bit. No, no. I would say the through line sonically, you know, if you're Sonic brand, if you will, all those songs have a place on the album. And then from, you know, my perspective as a sync agent, um, we're working on a show for Lifetime. And it just so happens they were looking for songs that speak to the lyrics of ocean, rivers, water. So, of course, what? Yes. 
I'm your man. Here we go. Let's go. <laughs> Let's go. We're going to set it up. No. So that's, you know, and that through line there, uh, Katie, because same with, you know, maybe Memphis and I don't, some of your songs, you know, there, there'll be that time and place, whether it's New Mexico or Houston, that moment yeah. that might be. So is that perhaps maybe you were with the pumpkins touring through a city and that happened or those songs. Well, I mean, well yeah. to be honest, even songs like maybe Memphis, mm -hmm. I was just fine. Like I never really think I never write for the moment. I write for the bigger emotional moments. So mm. I, you know, I thought it was an interesting idea rather than talking about the people you're in relationships with talking about the places you're in relationships with people. So you, you know, kind of like a play on words using the the cities rather than names of people. I thought that was kind of an interesting idea, yeah. but I do know as a sync person, I do understand there's a very big difference between um, something being subtext and something being a specific nature for a sync. So I do know that a song like maybe Memphis, because it drops this name and that name and there's all these different cities, it's hard to think, oh, that's a, general it's not a general s lyric for mm -hmm. a general uh tv or film audience it's got to fit mm -hmm. that moment and that's why like i do know like a lot of people that do write for sync avoid this specificity that comes with the lyric writing right. but i love specific lyrics as yeah. a lyric writer so i do have yeah. a bit of struggle with that but i do know that like at least river flow is a very general uh general story and a general relatable journey mm -hmm. but i do i do get very caught up in writing um elaborate lyrics because i love you know bernie Torpin and i love that i love i love lyrics that and, and you know bowie i love these esoteric and psychedelic lyrics that yeah. play with your perception of what's happening um mm -hmm. you know i love that as a writer but i do know that for what you do mm -hmm. you, that that makes it difficult but i do have songs that play play to a bit more of a general audience too. So those are always the ones that I send you and I'm like, but this one. <laughs> <laughs> no, Katie, no. And I think, you know, two things can be said is, you know, we're covering the bases and at least, you know, the alternatives, is, like you said, is if you name a loved one's, you know, if my mate's name is Michelle or Beatles, Michelle, my bell, it's very specific, but at least the chances of a scene in Memphis or Houston, that's a greater probability or there's, yeah. you know, the montage scene driving through Memphis. So, but no, it's a beautiful song. Um, and what, you know, one thing we could do, I was going to share my screen and then we could play a couple excerpts from the, from what I had queued up was sure. river flow. Mm -hmm. And then let's see here. We can, um, so then folks can check out your release on Spotify and download and buy it. And uh, let's see here. All right. I'm just going to share this. All right. So this is River Flow. So deep and blue and black I can't tell if the riptide Has come to take me back Ain't trying to walk on water Just trying to find my place But something a little wilder Keeps calling my name Whatever it is Wherever it goes Winding round and round through the highs and lows, driving through rock, mark my name in stone. I'm like the river flow. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful track. My ass is. The guitar, is that your, I know you do a lot of work with Yamaha, but the tone on the guitar is beautiful. Well, it's a, most of the guitar on that song is played by um, a session guitarist called Ilya Tushinsky. And I can't remember which guitar he was playing, but I know it was one that just sounded bright, but kind of warm at the same time. 
The best thing about having great musicians to work with is going, here's my part and you can play it better than me. (laughs) You know? And I'm not ashamed to be like I there are there's a lot of stuff on on this entire EP that I'm playing on, but some songs it's like, well, you you gotta play it. You're playing it way better than me. And you you've got you got the feel and he does these little intricate little doodads and I can't like, you know, that's you. Yes. No, no. Love the uh the warmth of it, like you said. And also I love that that line, the metaphor about uh, the ocean. Or I'm not trying to walk on water. I'm just yeah. trying to, yeah, that's brilliant. So I, I think, <laughs> you know, that's for, especially post-pandemic, the day in the day, in day the tri- trials and tribulations of life, what we're all trying to just get well, through. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I was <laughs> thinking about this earlier about how you, the pandemic kind of shut us all down and kept us all very <clears throat> locked away from experiences or doing anything. Like, I know, yes, walking to the kitchen can be a journey, but it's not. But it's like once we actually finally kind of got over this sort of hump, like the idea of like, well, I can actually get out there and live my life now. You know, a lot of people change career paths. A lot of people change directions and adapted and pivoted and just Mm -hmm. felt a sense of freedom. Um, You know, it it was a scary time. It's still scary. Mm -hmm. But people decided to kind of go in different directions. So I, I really felt that this song was a important one to add onto the EP for that reason, that it's a sense of freedom and like however you want to get there in in your own little journey, Mm -hmm. even if it's just to the kitchen. (laughs) (laughs) Love it. Love it. No, brilliant. Brilliant. That's um, well said. And then we can play, I was going to play an excerpt from, uh, it's also on your EP. It's the fourth track, uh, maybe Memphis, and we'll cue this up. She says this road looks just like any other road As she fills up the tank somewhere in New Mexico This voice still echoes, I'm sorry, in the dark of her mind as the clouds roll in, her heart takes the wheel to drive. She said hello to Houston. He just left to boost when she landed in Santa Fe. Then love just wanted to say goodbye. She wants to give it one more try So maybe Memphis this time Fought no broken white lines for miles So she had enough And headed out west Then left Phoenix in the dust After he raised her hand, her note on the table just read I can roll with the punches, but this isn't what I meant She said hello to Houston He just left to boost when she landed in Santa Fe a very nice very nice and as i was re-listening to that song there uh i think what's brilliant is we do you know a lot of pitches to uh when all the auto adverts for subaru and but just on that imagery you know driving through the desert from town to town seeing the stars above and again it's uh you know the, the warmth of your voice and then the acoustic guitar and i think just the simplicity of the track of you can focus there's the arrangement you know yeah, it is very simple so. and we, we did actually play with the idea of having like no background vocals just because it was one of those maybe this is enough but then as soon as like I you know I d- recorded the background vocals and those parts it was like ah I miss them like as soon as you could hear them and then not hear them it was like ah it just adds that extra sort of release when it hits that chorus but I see what you mean about um you know it could be if it as long as it's not a section where I'm talking about like 
you know, rolling with the punches and things like that. It's like it can it can work in a sensibility of like driving just to get away and get, you know, be free um, if it's the right section of the song for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's it, as I said, look, I struggle as a songwriter with I want to make things relatable and I want to make things uh, universal, but at the same time I feel like you have to put, as again, as a songwriter for an artistic outlet, not writing for sync, I always feel the need to add those little bits in there that tell the biggest story, the specific story, tell your story. If, mm. You know, maybe maybe there are people out there that want to get away that just can't. Um, so it's like, you know, I, I have that struggle in me that's like if I was to edit out the ugly, then I'd be like, you know, that's not actually how life is. Yeah. It is on Instagram, of course, because you look on Instagram and you're like, everyone's having a the best life. They're living their best life possible every single day. Why isn't my life like that? Mm-hmm. Because it's not real. You're able to edit and that's how, you know, that's how you appear to be successful and poor free on your face or whatever it is. But for me, it's like as a songwriter, I love to put those specific nuggets of even if it's just like a little teardrop of pain it's like it's just it makes it real so that when there is a good moment it's like it means more now no no 100 percent. because you know that is sort of a lane if you will of what we'll call trials and tribulations you know for a lot of briefs that come up and you know those types of through lines of struggling you know hard times because like you said life isn't always just rosy and uh you know and that's that's the challenge of as a sync agent selling that emotion and then it's up to us to connect your music to the right production but kind of wanted to tie in um you know over the years correct i know on the most current record for the smashing pumpkins vocals My question is, having worked with the band for a minute now, did that change in how your songwriting as an indie artist for your songs? Did they become darker at times or or not at all? Or you just sort of you compartmentalize your work with them and then you have your your indie sound, your your work? That's a really good question, I think. I mean, I've done obviously touring with the band for seven or eight years and I did background vocals and background vocal arrangements for the last two albums. I did it on their 2020 SEER project, which was 20 songs, and then the newest project, Autumn, is 33 songs. It's a lot to sort of, and it's considered to be a rock opera, so it's big vocals, big arrangements, big sort of, and a more orchestral approach to parts of vocals so that they become this other element that sort of plays into the sound or the storyline or the through line of um of the three acts that make up this 33 song um very ambitious project i think um because i grew up listening to so much so much music i mean it was really everything from you know led zeppelin and pink floyd you know to aretha and stevie wonder and like i i just had such a a wonderful musical experience growing up that nothing, I wasn't really limited so much from what I got to hear. So it all sort of went in. So when I became a songwriter, all of those things sort of go in there. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they have moments where they can come out and songs of mine that have been a little bit more rock influenced. I can, you know, I can stretch out and be like, well, here's this element here now that Mm -hmm. I might've learned from Led Zeppelin or whoever. Mm -hmm. And then, here's this element and this, this more soul element and I can bring it out in a song of mine, like short story long. I could be like, I'm going to be Aretha for a minute. Not, not, a, not completely Aretha, just a, like a little Aretha, not full Aretha. Uh, so you, know, you get to kind of play with your idols through the things that you write and step into shoes and see what fits when it's all in there, it's all in there and it's all accessible at any given time. So, so diving into their projects, I'm just able to access the greater, you know, encyclopedia, encyclopedia of music. So when yeah. it's rock opera and then I think of, you know, Queen and the Suite and I think of layered vocal elements, whether it's coming from, you know, Fleetwood Mac or Mamas and Papas or whoever, it doesn't matter what's yeah. going on, but I'm like, okay, this song's a bit more psychedelic. Well, what, 
you know, and then I'll do a deep dive and listen to like a bunch of Bowie or I'll listen to a bunch mm -hmm. of Pink Floyd or I'll listen to a bunch of whatever it is, the zombies, what, whatever it is, and just dive in and go, well, where's that going? Yeah. And I think, um, I think once you, once you sort of realize that it's all in there, it's all in there all the time. Mm -hmm. So I just don't have a huge outlet to be able to express, um, those, what what you would do in a rock aspect for my music, but when there are moments like I, I will use them. Yeah, but it's not appropriate for me to put, you know, thirty seven layers of vocals on an acoustic song. Mm. <laughs> you know, <laughs> super fun, and I do I tr have a true passion for arranging because I think it can it can help support a lead vocal, like a background vocal arrangement can help support what's happening instrumentally, and there's been moments where like this keyboard part's happening and so I'll sing along with that and then extend it on with another, like an mm. echoey part that pans this way and pans that way. And like yeah. I, I invent movement and I, inv I invent sort of these three-dimensional moments that can happen mm. when the music's still going but then there's this other thing that's happening because mm. vocals take your emotional focus. Mm -hmm. So a lead vocal's happening, you're focusing on it. But then it's like there's a gap for 20 seconds before the next lead vocal comes in. So I'm always like well, what, what should go there? So it's right. like handshaking the emotional content to the next lead vocal. So I was thinking yeah. in those sorts of terms. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I've – I always learn from every experience, so I can't say I've def, definitely been affected by my work with the pumpkins. I, I think I'm more affected by the fact that I get to sort of be on stage and watch what they do and watch how yeah. they are in business and watch how they are sure. with the media and – Mm -hmm. I think all of those things help me more as a human being than um, the creative aspect. I've, I've seen Billy and work with Billy in the studio, you know, a bit and, and obviously working on these songs, I get to see how it's like they're very unrelenting with their focus. Mm. Like if, if Billy, like if Billy's in there with, with Jimmy or whoever, and they're, they're just building a track, I've seen Billy like play through, here's this riff I've got. But then he'll switch it and be like, well, here's what it is on in this key. And now here's an, on piano. And this is what mm. it sounds like like this. And this is what it sounds like like that. And let's slow it down like 10 BPM. What's it sound like? He'll try so many different iterations of things to go. Yeah. This is the best version of, like, this is the song. But this is the best version of the song. This is the best key for the song. And this mm -hmm. is the best stylistic choice for the song to go, I can apply that to my music it's not yeah. necessarily a songwriting element it's not necessarily a i don't know even a musicality it's just a sure take your time with an idea and be really sh like it's okay to try new things you can always go back to what you do and i've right. always had that approach with rewriting but okay. i've always think i've always thought with rewriting is more of like a bit of arrangement and more focused on lyrics and melodic structure mm. but knowing that i can also do that with the key of the song, the tempo of the song, mm -hmm. and then also add those elements of arranging into it and add those elements of melodic and um, lyrical structure. I've learned that for sure. Okay. Yeah. Um, it's always interesting though. It's, you, you never know what's going to stick with you until you apply it on your next project or your next thing and you're yeah. like, it did go in. Some I did. I learned a thing. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. I would imagine, Katie, because correct – you know, it's sort of when you're in that moment and then there takes time to reflect and process all the new things that are, you know, coming in your learning at the moment and also to thread the needle. Because correct, I know when you it first started out, you were opening for, I think you get, got a call from Billy because the through line is uh, Howard produced your record and he obviously produces for the pumpkins. So when you got the call from Billy Corrigan to open for the pumpkins, talk about, there were some certain songs that you covered to be able to vibe with the smashing pumpkins audience and sort of. Well, yeah, mm -hmm. I think it's important to, yeah, it's all, it's always important to know your audience. Mm. Like, obviously, I mean, I came from a background of playing live for, so many years and I did so many gigs a week and it was hours of music and I learned, you know, hundreds and hundreds of songs that I would play. So like my understanding of like why a song's a hit and what audiences these songs work with was already dialed into a certain um, respect because mm -hmm. 
you know, it's like to like when you write a set list to write the arc of the set list so that, you know, even, even if I'm playing three sets to know in set three, I've got to play this song and this song and this song because it's like got to keep your attention so the faster paced songs end up in the third set. Whereas if I'm playing one long set, yeah. I want to play a couple of fast ones, take it, take a little bit of a dip in the middle, then pick it up again towards the end, but not have your fastest song at the very end, end with something a little more reflective. So it's like, I want some more. And then I'll be yeah. like, you can purchase all my merch. <laughs> and music, of course. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. And good night. <laughs> but to play with the band, it was um, mm-hmm. more of a respect of, uh, I opened up a show for Billy and then that graduated on to opening up for the band, but also playing bass with the band. So I was doing yeah. double duty and the association with like, I'm opening up for the band, but also playing with the band, the fans kind of got, they got the connection and they got, you know, you're playing these kind of pop Americana songs and then there's this band. But because those couple of tours that I did when I first started with the band were more somewhat scaled back Okay. when I played acoustic and then we played these sort of somewhat acoustic but, ele- you know, somewhat electronic and somewhat rock songs wasn't too far of a separation mm-hmm. so people kind of connected the dots a little bit better than rather it being me playing acoustic and then there's this wild rock man that's playing but that <laughs> did happen like we did a show in in Norway it was like the start of our European tour in 2019 where the opening band um, dropped out because they were ill um, mm-hmm. I think the lead singer was horribly ill and so I get the you know the knock on my dressing room door that, like at four o'clock or whatever it was and the uh-huh. tour manager's like so do you want to open the show? It's either going to be you or no one. And so I was like, okay, let me, give me, I basically said, literally give me 20 minutes to go through my songs because I, all I've been doing is pumpkining. Yeah. Go through my songs. Okay. I remember my songs. That's good. Um, cause sometimes, sometimes you, cause you go on autopilot, sometimes you go through your songs and you're like, I don't remember who I am anymore, <laughs> where I am. Again, I mean, I'm in Europe, so I don't, I'm already in a different time zone and, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know, it's, it's very strange. But, you know, did the sound check and opened up this big show that was supposed to be a very, very heavy rock band opening. Um, mm-hmm. Wow. Well, they weren't, weren't quite death metal, but it was like very heavy rock, uh-huh. like Viking rock sort of <laughs> opening the show. Uh-huh. So I basically did my, you know, hey, I'm Katie Cole. You, you might remember, remember me from such bands as the band that is about to play next. You know, I, I do a bit of shtick and I bit of, do a bit of dialogue. I'm quite friendly and most people in Europe actually speak a lot of English. So, you know, me saying stuff went over quite well and mm-hmm. you can play the music and then talk, introduce the songs then talk, no. then of course play a cover that sort of connects with them. And I think even at that show I played like a New Order cover and yeah. people will go, go, oh, okay, I get this now. You know, right. you are also from this world. You know, mm-hmm. once you've kind of got that aha uh-huh moment from the, mm-hmm. the crowd, then it's like it's all, you know, smooth sailing. But I think having it like I've been on stage for years. I'm so used to performing. I'm so used to being myself. I'm a goofball. I say goofy things into the mm-hmm. microphone, but I own it and that's my thing. Yeah. And I'm very personable and I might tell stories about this or that or whatever it is, but being comfortable on stage doesn't yeah. matter what who you're playing with is such a big part of mm. just owning that presence so that there is it's like there is a big difference between me playing my set and me getting on stage and playing with the smashing pumpkins but there isn't mm. because it's me and mm-hmm. I'm just stepping into a role and yeah. once you actually go oh and they you know because people will go to a pumpkin show and be like who's that girl which what what on earth is she doing and they'll <laughs> google Katie Cole and they'll be like Oh, and once you see there's a rabbit hole to go down and go down it, you're like, well, there's substance music and a catalogue of songs to back this up. It's not just some random person doing random stuff. Yeah. You know, all the stuff and all the gigs that I did over the years definitely with like the long, you know, pregame right. <laughs> to do all of this. Yes. No, no, that's amazing. And I think that actually sets up because <clears throat> prior to, our, you know, in the last segment you were kind of talking about, your fine detail between your vocals and then the arrangement, what's happening between, say, you know, the hook and the chorus and the bridge. 
composition, scoring or composing for film or television. Has that ever, do you see a chapter in your life of uh, walking in the shoes or, you know, foot, footsteps of, of a composer? I think I could probably work with somebody in that respect to be able to go, this is what we need to do. Here's my basic, um, you know, here's my basic sort of set up for how I want this intro to go, this section, this section. I don't think I'm as musically um, skilled in terms of uh, just knowing your musical theory to be able to know the language. I've, I've worked with um, orchestral leaders and things like that for my sessions yeah. and also sat in on other sessions for people. And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. there is a language, there's a skill set that's knowing this terminology and that terminology to, to, to know how to, how to move an orchestra forward, how to – slow this section down how you know how we can move this this energy to a, like a lower paced energy like there's all these different terminologies that I'm not super familiar with right. I can write them and like I I might do them I don't know what they're called sure. it's like half the stuff that I play on piano or guitar I'm like I know exactly what I'm doing if I'm to explain it to someone else it will take me a while got it cuz I'm yeah. so I'm such a uh natural player and I, I use my ear for music I know exactly where this is I, I don't know if I'm technically pitch perfect but I'm close to that but I can hear it I know where it yeah. is I know the yeah. inversion on guitar I know the inversion on piano I can find it mm -hmm. I can play it I can teach it to myself mm -hmm. but being able to do that in an organic sense for my own composition for tv and film I think I would need to be sitting underneath somebody that is more skilled than I mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. wouldn't rule it out though, but I do yes. think I would need the help. Yes. No, no. And you know, cause to thread that needle, you know, two degrees of separation, um, out of Scandinavia, we worked with Flora cash who their manager was, he also manages, uh, James Eha. And mm -hmm. I know James has been doing some, some he's, he's, it's scoring and composition for, I believe some television shows. Yes. So just, he does. Yeah. That, yeah. Yeah, he's, yeah. Very he's really talented and mm -hmm. I think it takes time to sort of switch gears to know that world. And I'm not going to be arrogant and be like, I can write a song, therefore I can, I can't, like it takes sure. me a minute. Like even when I'm writing string parts for my music, right. um, it takes me a minute to go, well, these are the violins doing this and these are the cellos doing this and this is, you know, this is what they're able to handle in terms of notation between this key mm -hmm. and this key that they, they mm -hmm. fit there mm -hmm. and then this and then tech, you know, then I need something textural here. So let's add some you know, violas here. You know, it takes me a minute to go what parts yeah. doing what and why. Right. But I can work it out. But it just yeah. takes, because it takes me so long. I to, I think if I was to be working with somebody that could help sort of just bridge that gap a bit, that would be, that would make way more sense. Um, <laughs> somebody that can be like, yeah, yeah, it's this. And I'd be like, cool. <laughs> no, no. Because also, you know, to thread the needle, I think, visually what you do with your videos it's a companion piece with your songs and the through line and how you storyboard and really so i know you yeah. you know you you have that uh that skill set there so i was just kind of curious um yes i'm not again i wouldn't i wouldn't rule it out i just think i yeah. would need to be i'd much i need to be much more learned than i am in terms sure. of my musicality but i do think um I always think of bigger picture and I always think of like what's next and what else can yeah. I learn. And I'm still, you know, I'm, st I still get ahead of myself too quickly, but it just takes so long to fulfill some of these things that I have in my mind or that I'm writing mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that I also have to be patient enough to stay focused because I, I think even, you know, even 20, 30 years ago, you would have a team and then mm -hmm. it was so much easier because your record label would take care of this and this and this. Mm -hmm. And now mm -hmm. it's like there are record labels, but their, their risk factors are so high that yeah, there's no point in them taking on someone like me. I mean, I've, you know, I've had little deals here and there and I've had things that I've turned down here and there, but I think um, I, I need to have a control over what I do and I need to own it. Yes. And for someone else to be like, well, we want to use this person because of this reason and that reason. I I don't think that would vibe well with me. I think I'm now at a point as a songwriter yeah. and as an artist that I'm like, yeah. I just want to do things on my terms that yeah. I'm interested in that I can look back in 10 years' time and mm -hmm. be like, 
that's still a really good piece of music and not and yeah. I didn't cut corners like I didn't it end is. up with a circle accidentally right well said yeah <laughs> not settling staying authentic and and true to who you are and and so that said so rivers and roads just came out recently uh and then you just came back for the massive tour with pumpkin so what's the remainder of the year look like for uh you can be playing locally in nashville for for this ep and and, and or what's, what's yeah, the yes well i've got a couple of shows to do in nashville um before i go out on the road for a massive tour with the pumpkins if we're good we're playing this summer with um um interpol stone Temple pilots and rival sons and that's like july through september I think it'll be after that that I'll probably put together my basically my EP release shows that will be belated. But again, what I said, the right thing at the right time. There's no <laughs> point in me rushing to get to, to get something put together when it's like I don't have the time to make it the right thing. I'd rather wait till I'm actually off the road and I can plan it and put together like a good lineup of bands and mm -hmm. you know do something with musicians that I care about. Um, I think that I think that's probably something I'll end up doing in Nashville. Yeah. I don't know if I'll be able to visit too many other cities. If if any, it's just it's it's very difficult um, to tour as a solo artist because there's a lot of logistics involved with uh, musicians, you know. Right. Because you have to pay them. <laughs> you don't have to, but I do because I respect yeah. them and I know how difficult yeah. it is to be a a touring musician and I want I want the musicians that I play that I play with to actually enjoy the experience and mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. they'll give they'll give their all to something if they're enjoying it yeah no no it's and also just to plant that seed because I know you've done stuff in the past with the NAM show yes. but I know NAM's coming back I just went about a month ago and then they'll, they'll be back here in Los Angeles in January any mm -hmm. um any anything on the calendar with with do you, I don't know. Off? I'll yeah. have to talk to um to some of my sponsors like Yamaha and Sennheiser. I do a lot of stuff with Sennheiser still. Mm -hmm. Um I'll see. I, I don't know. I love I do actually love coming back to do NAM every so often. It's it's if for those that don't know, it's a trade show for um musical products, musical uh dealers. It's it's basically like it's music. It's music heaven or music hell, depending on what you, which aisle you walk down, because you can walk down an aisle and see like some live performances by someone on like a cool piano doing a piece. And then you're like two aisles over and it's just like cymbals and drums. Like, <laughs> right. and, you, and your brain is just like sensory overload. Like I need to just, I need to peace out for a minute. Uh -huh. It's a lot. Um, but it's, it is still super fun. I usually end up connecting with, um, mm -hmm. you know, friends and cause I used to live in LA for a few years. I usually run into people that I know and brands that I know and people that have, you know, basically given me opportunities throughout the years too. So, I mean, I hope so. I don't know, yeah. but I hope so. No, no. Cause it was, I feel that this last one, a couple months ago, it was scaled back. So there, a lot of the, of the merchants weren't there. So for this next iteration 2024 it's going to be you know bells and whistles but it's like you said it's uh it could be heaven or hell but uh i hadn't been in a minute and then i'm like great now i'm looking at gear i don't need but i want it <laughs> yeah exactly it's exactly but it's you know it's useful for those that um are in the business to learn what's new out there and for those that aren't or that that just want to sort of jump into it sometimes mm -hmm. you can find that little magical interface or piece of equipment that can help you do your own yeah whether it's podcasting or recording mm -hmm. or live streaming mm -hmm. sometimes it's like seeing someone in in real time and in real life actually sh using this product you can be like oh that's not difficult and that's right. you know that's what i that's what i need but the yeah the problem with people like you and i is is like everything <laughs> is what i need <laughs> <laughs> yeah no 100 percent um but no we will definitely um, we'll keep in touch about that because what's interesting, Katie, just on the side closing note, this recent NAM they actually did more educational panels. Yeah. They had you know just talking about sync, the industry in general. So that was kind of neat to see. Um, cool. But yeah, and then um, so I'll definitely for this episode, we'll post up uh, all the links to the Spotify where folks can. Correct, Bandcamp. They can get this the newest yeah, Rivers the new, and Roads. The, yes, the the merch will be launched on Bandcamp shortly. Um, 
I have, to, you know, I had to bypass a little bit of time to allow for like my Kickstarter crowdfunding people to get all their merch and magical stuff first. Um, mm-hmm. But everything's on whether it's Spotify, Apple, wherever you wherever you find music, I'll be there. But the actual merchandise, I think the best thing to do is just to visit my website, which is katiecoleofficial dot com. You can find all the links to everything in the universe there. Pretty brilliant. Much. <laughs> no, we'll definitely we'll link through from the Blue Buddha website, uh, on this podcast, Sync Riffs. And no, it was uh, amazing to have you on the show. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm glad we were able to share a couple of your tracks. And then, um, you know, we will continue the chat and um, make sure everyone checks out your music. But thank you so much, Katie. It was great chatting. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Yes, no, our my pleasure. And with that... We'll see everybody next week. Thanks so much for tuning into Sync Riffs. And thank you, Katie Cole. And uh, have a great week, everybody. Go.